Welcome to the Farm Beats podcast. Farm Bits is proudly produced by Nebraska Digital Agriculture Team and hosted by students at the University of Nebraska. The Farm Beats podcast comes to you each week to discuss the trends, the realities, and the value of digital agriculture. Through interviews with experts, producers, and innovators from across the agricultural industry, we hope that you step away from each episode with new practical knowledge of digital agriculture. Hello, Farm Beats followers, and welcome to another episode of the Farm Beats podcast. I'm Jose Cesario. And I'm Emily Hansen, and we're glad to have you with us as we begin diving into the topic of digital tools and animal production. Today, we are joined by Amos Peterson, founder and CEO at FarPro. FarPro has developed technology to help with hog production. With that, let's jump into this episode with Amos. I'm a farm kid. Uh, my grandparents on both sides farmers um my my parents <clears throat> got into farming when i was younger we lived out west and then moved back uh when i was younger to farm with my granddad and uh <clears throat> i got in involved in you know it wasn't a commercial scale farm i think my you know my parents were always trying to make a commercial scale But, uh, you know, we raised every animal under the sun. It was like, I think we had everything from sheep and pigs and donkeys and all of that. <clears throat> But really, uh, in a less than commercial setting, it was difficult, right? There's a lot of animal loss, especially with the, the pigs. There's a lot of um, trying to resuscitate, you know, animals and putting them on heaters and in bathtubs and trying to keep them warm in the winter. <clears throat> really difficult work. So when I went to school, I wasn't really that interested in being a farmer, although I wanted to serve my, you know, uh, friends and family. So I, I got a, into electrical engineering and economics and started a company for providing wireless internet service to underserved areas in uh, actually my hometown and surrounding areas in Minneapolis, Iowa. <clears throat> and then uh, got uh, involved in a entrepreneurial program through the university, the John Papa John Entrepreneurial Center, and ran into some problems in the pork industry, commercial pork industry, that were a lot like the problems that we had faced when uh, we were just doing the smallholder farming, and realized that they were, the, the industry uses the same methods that we were using. It's just, it was stalls and heat lamps and, um, you know, just struggling to keep the piglets warm and the sows cool and so that i could apply what what i knew to solve those problems and set about doing that right so started up a company fair pro to help in the fairing room initially to solve the issue of uh the thermal divide between the sow and the piglets the sows need to be cool the piglets need to be about 30 degrees warmer than the sow or more And i um, not sure, you know, what you know about the pork industry, but uh, that's been a struggle. They use lamps to keep the piglets away from the sow because the sow can roll over and crush the piglets if they try to get warm next to the sow. It's inefficient. Um, the lamps cause a lot of uh, radiative heating of the environment that heat up the sow and, and make her uh, and stress her out, frankly. So we built the Haven, which is a is kind of the the hundred percent solution to the problem, and uh, that was well received. We we did some testing, found that we we were able to reduce crushing death by over thirty percent, and prewean mortality in piglets by over twenty percent. But there were some issues there. Uh, it's a big, expensive piece of equipment. So it, it found a niche more with uh, show pigs, which are high value animals and people treat them like children. Frankly, I think they put makeup on the, I mean, you know, you say you don't, can't, it's like putting lipstick on a pig, but there are people that do that. I've met them. So uh, yeah, it's a, uh, so then, you know, the commercial solution for the farmers is really just a improvement on the the products that they already use. So, It, we we looked at some pain points with heating mats and came out with a graphene powered heating mat that is is virtually indestructible 
Um, and that's that the environmental, the heating part of the equation went to that, to mats and other implements that are more affordable for farmers. And then we took the smart haven concept because the haven was also going to be an analyzing the animal and we turned it into like a Fitbit for pigs. So that's what this is. This is the sentry tracker and it's an active, uh, active edge computer and data logger. And that's, that's where we, where we went with the roadmap in that direction. So that brings us to today where uh, we are in soft launch with the tracker and the full sentry system. And we have uh, our heating products on the market as well. They're kind of touch points for customers. And uh, we think the, the best, most efficient mat in the, in the market. But the future of the company is definitely precision livestock farming and enabling the digital future of animal agriculture. So that's, wow, that's not just my background. I think I, I came full circle with a full bio and pitch, but. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. That's, that's really I, cool. Um, and I like how you mentioned a bunch of different products there. So can you tell us where FairPro is based out of and where are your, most of your customers based? Yeah, we are in Iowa City is the headquarters, and we also have a, an office at the research park in Ames, so the Iowa State Research Park. Mm -hmm. okay. Our customers, well, and so our customers are, you know, the pork industry is concentrated in the Midwest, like 85% of the pigs are in the Midwest. So uh, Iowa has a third of the pigs about, it's a, so they're next, they're, they're where we are, we're where the pigs are. And uh, then there's the Eastern Corn Belt, Ohio, and uh, in North Carolina, you know, thanks to Smithfield and the Prestige guys and, and what have you. So, yeah, it seems like a, a nice place to be, right? For these. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And bullseye. Right. And can you explain a little bit more of what kind of information does this sentry system track? Yeah, the sentry system. So, the, the tracker itself tracks uh it records animal temperature so body temperature of the ear as a reference and ambient temperature so the conditions close to the animal and then it analyzes the behavior of the animal through a bank of uh, sensors at the rate of about 25 times a, a second and then it records those those component behaviors on the tracker so whatever's been happening in that minute um, on a minute frequency. So whatever has been happening uh, for the majority of that minute gets recorded as the state or the behavior of, in that minute. And then that information stored in memory and uploaded every half an hour through a Bluetooth gateway or directly to the, the tablet. And there, are, there are really three parts to the sentry system. The first part is the tracker which is sort of allows the animal to speak, right? So um, tells the, the system how the animal's doing. And then there's the, the mobile app, which lives on the tablet for the worker. Uh, and they interact with the animals, record their interactions with the animals, completion of tasks, treatments, et cetera. And then the third part is what we call the control center. And that's where the veterinarians and the managers and the supervisors tag in they can change SOPs and, uh, you know, change the dials as they need. And it's a, it's a complete feedback loop that way. So, um, so that's the broad overview of the system. Yeah. I know you showed us the tracker, but how big exactly is it? Um, how much does it weigh and how does that compare to other types of hog tags on the market? Yeah. So it's, we designed it to be, slipstreamed into the same it goes in the exact same way as a, a regular inventory tag would right we have an adapter i wish i had the applicator with me but we just have an adapter head that goes on a standard tagger this slots right in to that adapter it applies exactly like you would apply a normal tag at the base of the ear between those two tendons so it's a little a little heavier, it does have a battery, so it's a little bit heavier 
mainly due to the weight of that battery. But you know, our targets of uh, like 14 or 15 grams, we're in another iteration uh, that uses a, a larger reusable battery because these are these are what you would call like a disposable product they're sealed hermetically sealed so that one's going to be a little bit bigger but there's still you know if we're looking at um biocompatible they're very biocompatible they've been tested you know in the field now for uh over 18 months in this iteration and our retention rate even in finishing is a hundred percent which i think is better than uh, inventory tags so we have not lost, we have not lost one in our, even in our finishing trial. Um, and you know, their finishers are not there. You know, the, it was a small, a shorter trial, but it, they have a very good retention rate. So they're not too heavy. Uh, they don't seem to bother the pigs. And uh, yeah, they, they go in just like the normal inventory tag. That's pretty cool, Amos. And yeah, you mentioned about all these sentry trackers, but how many of that can be used for collecting data and retrieving this data on your tablet, for example? Yeah, good question. So the tablet has a native ability to link with, I think, six trackers at once. However, um, that's in, I would call it the backup mode, right? So generally, where there's connectivity, we'll have a Bluetooth gateway that interfaces with the internet on the back end. So it's Bluetooth on the on the tracker side and Wi-Fi on the internet side. Uh, we can also do a cell back end. So where there's a cell connection but no Wi-Fi access, we can substitute that. So the trackers generally post their data to the cloud and then that's synchronized with the tablets. Although in certain limited applications, we've done this with projects, you don't need internet access. You just, you can use a tablet and you can actually download the data directly to the tablet. So you don't have to go through that, uh, through the cloud. So can the tablet be used without the trackers? Yes. We, and it's, it is possible. It's a, a complete system without the tracker. So the tablet, the mobile app is a uh, task management. You know, uh, you input data, uh, the control center pushes tasks to the workers that way, right? And gets feedback from the workers that way. So there is there is the ability to use the, the software, the tablet, the control center app and software without the trackers, the trackers are what automate the system, really. So, I mean, you can input, you can make observations as an employee, as a herdsman, and put those into the into the tablet. And you would, you know, I mean, there are things in the barn that the trackers won't be able to automate, like if there's a fence that needs repair, you know, a gate that needs repair, something like that. But um, it's really meant to it's meant to complement the, the tracker system. So it's built with that in mind, you know, to complete that picture. But, you know, for instance, we can use the system. Uh, we have a module for finishing pigs. Our, our main focus is sows and piglets primarily, but we also have a module for finishing pigs. And, you know, we don't need to put a tracker in every finishing pig that wouldn't be economic, economically feasible, right? And there's a lot more, if you go to maybe a 5% uh, sampling rate, so one in 20 finishing pigs have a tracker, the economics come back around, but then, you know, now you're relying a lot more on the herdsmen kind of making their observations as well, right? So um, it's meant, meant to have a little bit of uh, information margin in there, if you will. That's amazing, Amos. So you were mentioned that 5% of the pigs, would you pick like randomly these pigs and that's a good question i wish <laughs> so my degree is not in animal science or and i have studied statistics but we have you know we work with good animal science people and that's what they tell us so between five and ten percent a good um to get good power you know in a in a study five ten percent a good sampling rate for the kinds of behavior that that we want to notice in finishers 
Now with sows, it's going to be one to one, right? So every sow is going to have a, a tracker, just because they're they're that unit of production that needs to be looked after and cared for um, upstream as as much and as closely as possible to provide benefits all the way through the the system afterwards. So with um, the Sentry system, is there training available for like prospective customers or new customers? Yes, absolutely. In fact, um, are the training, so we have uh, integration teams that, you know, there's some, every boy, you wouldn't think that it's this way, but in the pork space, you know, every integrator does things a little bit differently. You know, you can't really, it's not a one size fits all. You can't just drop a packet on someone's desk and say, here's how you use it. So everything from the layout of the buildings to their own SOPs, I mean, uh, you know, it has to be integrated. We have to, we have to integrate with their system, right? We don't ask them to come to us. We we need to figure out a plan in every case uh, for successfully integrating with their system. So that's what we do. And uh, we pick a single site to begin with. We train the farm staff and train the, you know, sometimes there's a, a technology staff for purchasing and integration department on their end. And we would uh, work with them and train them and then give them the tools, monitor that for the first week. And and really, it's instead of uh, bringing the entire site online all at once, which ca would cause some serious disruption, we really tag into a specific phase of production, and then we just roll it out monthly. So it would take about six months to get to to get it up to speed smoothly. We don't want to be disruptive in the, in the space at all, right? So, so yeah. that's, we'd be monitoring that for the full six months, make sure that first site comes online and that they have everything they need to then implement that across the system. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense because you have to train them, right? To make sure everything runs smoothly. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned like that, you you've been working with different cost customers and I imagine that maybe they work with different breedings of hogs. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is this app built for any specific breeding or how does that work? Because I imagine that some breedings would respond differently than the others. That's a very good question. So yes, we have we've trained the we've trained our algorithm or we're training our algorithms on on uh, the genetics that we have available for our testing, right? But as we as we roll the product out, you know that's that's something that we'll see in the data. You know the differences between different genetic lines, and I think it's it's just one of the things that we will discover and and perfect with large volumes of data, right? And it isn't just genetics. You know, we're talking about differences across geographies and climates. And um, I mean, there are so many different things to account for. And what the, the beauty of the system is that it turns every barn into a laboratory, right? Because you've closed that feedback loop and you're recording enough, you're recording uh, passively things that you wouldn't be able to do without a research team, without a very well-funded research team. You know, all the different, all the differences even between barns in a system or sites in a system uh, will be correlated to different outcomes, right? And genetics is one of those. And, uh, you know, we, we'll we get a, a bigger picture of that as we get more information. Yeah, that's really cool. So is there like a monthly cost for the trackers or is it uh, you pay once when it's installed? How does that kind of work? It's a service model. So hardware is a service. Uh, we we don't want to sell widgets to people that would you know that can break and that we have to RMA and you know cause frustration. So it's it's just a per animal under management service, and there's a turn up fee and, of eighteen dollars per animal under management, and then after that it's uh, the basic algorithm which uh, in, includes all behavior. It's all the software, uh, the tablet that you, that you would need on the the worker side, 
the control system, the control center software, and the basic behavior detection, health detection algorithms, plus a special algorithm like lameness, estrus, or illness uh, for $18 a year. So $1.50 per uh, sow, or in that case, a sow per month. Yeah, that seems very affordable for that. <laughs> yeah, it, it took a lot of thinking, to, you know, because you're you're right. Um, you know, really, it was the anchoring into this core value proposition of lameness. I think that was a breakthrough for us. Uh, sow lameness is is getting so bad, and and sow uh, retentions just it's been such a it's been it's a, a challenge. I wouldn't say bad. It's just been more and more challenging every year, right? And so uh, there were some recent studies in commercial uh, with commercial integrators that showed that the value of early lameness detection is fifty dollars per sow per year. So we just took that core value proposition and we split it two thirds to the farmer, one third to us, and you know that's where we anchored everything. We think that even just that basic sow lameness value prop is enough to you know make make it uh make it worth the uh, effort the cost that's pretty cool Amos. Yeah. And, and and you mentioned previously about that this thing that maybe each customer has kind of his own loop research right mm -hmm. we were wondering if have these sentry trackers been used for a research tool like for yeah. any production welfare is there any team working on that constantly yes and unfortunately well i mean due to the nature i guess the sensitive nature of the research we can't really talk about a lot of that okay um, but they're very big you know like you would suspect animal health and nutrition companies that want to see how their products are affecting uh the their customers animals and we've seen uh, we've seen some success there and those are more project based, but it's a really, there's a, a, a much higher value for organizations, like you said, that do research and want to get that information from the animal. Yeah. Mm. Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to see those results and see all the yeah. impacts. <laughs> yes. No, I, I love, I love to be able to share them. It's, it's crazy. The things that you learn adjacent to the things that you were looking for have all, it, 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 that we have learned adjacent to the things that our customers are looking for have in turn informed the way that we uh, go about. I mean, for instance, I think I can disclose just a thing that we learned that was outside the scope of investigation. Uh, preliminary data suggests that the difference among the same genetic family in a uh, rate of gain is about 0.1 pounds per day per additional hour of rest. So the the variance is usually between about 18 to 20 and a half hours per day of rest. For every additional hour of rest of that 18 hour a day rester gets, they gain an additional 0.1 pounds on the finishing side. It's pretty incredible. That's yeah. impressive. Yeah. Um, what do you see the benefits of storing data online versus on paper? Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess you could just talk about all the problems that paper causes, right? So, you know, it's uh, everything from a biosecurity issue because it gets dirty in the room, you know? I mean, it's, and then it travels from place to place and people touch it and to uh, just lost records, uh, difficulties of audits, uh, everything from, I mean, even even if you're able to take the the data that you record on paper and faithfully reconstruct it again if you know this is just handwriting of somebody who's in a big hurry you know they, like uh optical character recognition almost doesn't work in a lot of cases because it's just difficult to read you're still it's still in a silo right and it's not actively, and maybe it maybe it gets put in weeks after that data could have been useful, right? So, uh, what the what digitizing that and making it current to to where we are does is 
you know, you can see an animal, you can actually see an animal getting sick a day before it's clinical, when it's subclinical. I mean, that's at least what we've seen with the system. Probably as we get more data, we'll, we'll be able to bring that even, um, make that even further noticeable, further in advance. Or lameness data, you know, uh, we can detect an animal going lame. At least we've been able to see lameness developing up to a month before it's clinical, right? So, and you know, animals are, uh, pigs are prey animals. And so when people are around, you know, they, they, um, they don't want to show weakness. It's a, it's very difficult for a herdsman to notice these things. So it isn't just the, isn't just the digitization and that's a big part of it, but it's the currency of that information that really makes the system valuable. It's being able to proactively uh, preventatively care for the animals so they don't get sick and they don't get injured in the first place because you know it's that ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure um, in every interaction that, that a caretaker has with the animal you know it's just a more efficient way to do business yeah i definitely agree with that we work with research here and <laughs> how we can make some prevent preventive decisions right if you have stuff like faster and all the data on hand mm -hmm. yeah you can do a lot of decision making and talking about that uh, you mentioned all about this data that we have and the that the tracker collect but th does the company offer any decision making for the customers or is this data on their hands and they take the decisions by themselves we want to get to the point where we make i wouldn't say decision make decisions you don't want to make decisions necessarily for the customers, right? Uh, the veterinarians are the ones that made the decisions for the customers. What we want to do is give the veterinarians and the management the capability to make the best decisions that they can for their system. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't offer suggestions or default settings, right? So, you know, we can perform simple analyses of the data, like a regression analysis. We can window it to see if um, well, we can classify behavior as abnormal, you know, given a certain amount of data on a specific animal, right? Uh, and then we can all, and then we also give the veterinarians and managers the tools they need to set the alerts where it makes sense for their system. So just like we don't want to wait too long to treat an animal, we also don't want to spend valuable labor resources chasing uh, false flags. So you know, we want to make that, that uh, customizable, but, you know, in terms of um, sort of giving, giving a, a look into this, the state of the animal, we are, we're doing things like detecting estrus, right? So we can, we can uh, indicate that the animal is showing signs that they're ready to be bred, right? Um we can uh, we can detect illness. Now, illness comes in all different forms, and it could just be considered an abnormal expression of behavior, right? But there are certain kinds of things that happen when an animal is ill. There are changes in feed and water intake and, and that kind of behavior, lying versus standing. So we can give good indicators. Um, now, could we say that an animal definitively has purrs or something? You know, I... I don't, I don't think so, but we can, we can show that they're showing signs of indicative of that. Um, and then let the, the veterinarian decide what course of action to take. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, what do you see the main benefits are for the customers? Well, I mean, the value, per gosh, you know, this was, there are a lot of benefits and what we want to do is tag into the very core, easy to understand the strongest value propositions first, right? So all, obviously lameness reduction in the, in the stat, in sows, right off the bat, right? Managing the sow herd, guilt development, um, estrus detection, early illness prevention, perhaps even to the point of, you know, preventing a, a large scale outbreak on farm. 
which can cost a lot of money to the producer and just stress and, and be very disruptive. So those are our three primary value drivers. But we think that as much value will be gained by providing a, a way, I mean, this is going to sound maybe a little, I don't know, esoteric, but providing a way for employees and managers to see the impact they're having on their animals, right? Um, I mean, I'm putting myself in the shoes of a farm worker. Uh, you know, it's it's a difficult job. And sometimes it's difficult emotionally, you know. And a lot of times, you know, you, you see you see some you see things that are happening that are challenging uh but what you don't often see are the impacts that you're having on the animals in a positive way right so you can actually you could use this system to see your positive impact on it you can account you can uh you could account for your impact on the animals that you're raising right and in fact uh, managers would then could then promote assigned duties to those employees that they have that are having the, the most positive impact. And, you know, I, I think in this, it's a challenging labor environment for everyone, but especially in animal agriculture and, you know, giving the employees the tools they need to feel rewarded uh, in the jobs that they have is an important part of uh, improving the industry. And then, you know, there's also consumer confidence benefits. So, um, you know, if, as we, as our industry moves to be, I would say, uh, more of it, more accessible, right. That will improve consumer confidence in our products and, uh, you know, tracking and traceability are, are a big part of that too. And that's enabled by the, the types of things that we do in the ecosystem that we inhabit. Yeah. I, I agree with you. It's not a easy job, but if we, if we have like these tools that can help us to reduce the risk, right? Why not give a try? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And do you have any customers' histories that you would like to share with us today? Yeah. So, um, well, let's see. Uh, I think, yeah, I think, I think really the, one of the most interesting things that we discovered not just in a, a like a pure research, you know, looking for these things, sort of context, is this uh, is this correlation between uh, you know restfulness and 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 gaining weight, right? And then that opened this Pandora's box of you know why are these animals actually resting? Um, you know, there are issues that could be related to like gastric ulcers, for instance, that, you know, keep an animal lying on one particular one side rather than the other, you know. So just from, and really in this barn, we were just training finishing pig algorithms, right? That's all we set out to do to monitor those base behaviors. Uh, but then because we were able to get, you know, weight data, by the end of the study, we had this this uh, treasure trove of new things to look at, right? And uh, it and it helped the grower, who in this case was growing high value animals, uh, to better understand their own genetics, right? So that that in turn opens the door for, say, genetics companies to look at how to how to breed animals that aren't, um, you know that have a more of a tendency to rest or might uh, be less prone to gastric ulcers or something like that. So it's really this feedback loop that we're participating in, in the entire anim uh, pork ecosystem that, uh, that's, it's just really, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that we're able to participate. It's really exciting to, to be part of it. That's really cool. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges that fair pros faced with the century trackers and the tablet? Well, I would say the biggest challenge is supply chain, uh, strangely enough, right? I don't know how you guys are. I mean, everyone, everyone, you go to the store, you, know, you see signs for, you know, sorry, we, for stocking issues, you know, we're having supply chain problems 
all over the place, but I don't think it's anywhere it's as bad. Well, I mean, you know, there are things like formula shortages. I don't want to complain too much, right? But I mean, in manufacturing, you just cannot trust supply chains that come from overseas. It's just very difficult, right? So, uh, you know, our, our partners have been uh, overseas partners in the development of the tracker. And we've had to kind of pull that in a little bit and actually uh, look at how we can make stuff here in the US. And uh, it's, it's, it's a process, but, um, you know, we're almost through that process. It's just, it really, it's just been supply chain uh, issues primarily. Yep. And what are you most looking forward to in the future for the Fire Pro? Wow. Um, you know, as a founder and uh, chief enthusiast, I think, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I see, I see a lot of crazy stuff, you know, um, I see, I see us participating and not just in the pork industry, but across other animal ag verticals. You know, I see one, you know, one day when you look at a package of meat, you know, you'll be able to turn it over and you'll see the, you know, the ingredients, right. Which is just the supplies that went into this product. And, uh, you know, I see, uh, I see people, uh, all across the industry benefiting from dif uh, differentiation of a commodi currently commoditized product, you know? Um, and that's really the end goal, right? I mean, of course, along the way, you know, I mean, but I wouldn't say the end goal, but ultimately that's where we're headed. You know, animals are, are commoditized. It's just the way it is. And it's difficult to differentiate the product, but when you can, uh, you know, you'll get a higher return all across the supply chain, right? And, you know, I'm, I'm excited about that. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm excited to see more than anything. I'm excited to see how information about individual animals, how we can, you know, how that will be used to change the industry, right? How treating the individual animal and uh, listening to the individual animal will I suppose transform the way we care for the herd. Yeah. Does FairPro have any plans for expanding into other livestock species in the future? Yes. Uh, we've done some work with poultry, uh, cattle. You know, beef cattle is uh, there's a lot in the in the dairy space. I'll say already, and so that's why, you know, I think I think dairy is being served pretty well. Uh, but there are definitely uh, underserved animal ag verticals like uh, like poultry, where you know the econ still economics are an issue, right? You got to make something that poultry farmers can afford, and the birds are only there for just a few weeks. Uh, you know, layers are a different story, but um, you know, beef cattle is on our radar, and we hope to we hope to start that differentiation sometime you know, maybe 18 months to two years from now, really branch out. Mm -hmm. uh, that's amazing. It's amazing to see like how we will be able to track more animals other than only hogs and helping us and the producers to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And I was coming to the end of our interview here. If our listeners wanted to learn more about the Fire Pro, where can they find more information? Oh, you can go to www.fairpro.com. It's F-A-R-R-P-R-O.com. And, uh, you know, look us up or you can just, you can email uh, me at amos at fairpro.com. I'd be happy to uh, take questions from anyone who's interested. And then since we're at the end of our episode, is there anything that we didn't mention today that you would like to um, tell our listeners? Oh boy, I think I gave a a pretty thorough accounting let me think uh yeah you know i i just i'd say uh i'd say as as complicated 
you know, as complicated as technology like this might seem, it's not really that complicated. It might be complex how it works, but, um, you know, not, not to fear the technology for how it works, but, you know, adopt it for what it can do for you and for your farm, right? You know, like we, we, we uh, watch television, we're communicating over Zoom, you know, I'm completely comfortable turning on my television. I don't need to know how it, how it receives the broadcast, right, in order to be comfortable with that. And I think, I think we're getting there um, and we will we'll be there soon. Yeah, well, so. that, yeah, but thanks for the advice, uh, Amos. Thank you very much to Amos Peterson for taking the time to join this episode of the Farm Beats podcast. It's really exciting how FairPro have been developing products that help producers on tracking hogs for improve their management. One of my favorite parts of this episode and what this company is doing is how these trackers can support animal welfare as well as improve producers' profits. I agree. And I also think it's cool how lightweight and durable the trackers are. I hope you enjoyed this episode and we look forward to sharing another digital egg story with you next week on Farm Bits. Thank you for taking the time to join us today on the Farm Beats podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts to be informed about the latest content each week. We welcome your feedback. So if you have comments or questions for us, please reach out to us over email, on Twitter, or in the review sections of your favorite podcast platforms. Our contact information can be found in the show notes. We would like to thank Nebraska Extension for their support of this podcast and their commitment to provide high-quality informational material to members of the agriculture community in Nebraska and beyond. The opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on this podcast are solely their own and do not reflect the views of Nebraska Extension or the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. We look forward to you joining us next week for another episode of The Farm Beats.